This video is sponsored by Renogy. Have you ever wondered why all airplanes kind of look the same and why their design seems to never evolve? Well, this is an industry that's proven very resistant to change, with only minor variations made on the same turboprop and jetliners in the past 50 years or so. But NASA recently partnered with Boeing to develop what could be the next big thing in commercial aviation, their future VS-1 and VS-2 prototype aircraft with the cutting-edge transonic truss-braced wing concept, which will change the way jetliners look and fly forever. I'm Ricky, and this is 2-Bit Da Vinci. During its more than 100 years of history, Boeing has revolutionized the commercial aviation industry more than once. They did this in the 1950s with the introduction of the 707, the first commercially successful jetliner and grandfather to almost all modern passenger jets. Then they did it again in the 1970s when they introduced the wide-body 747 jumbo jet with its 400 plus passenger capacity that unlocked long-haul international flights to the masses for the first time in history. Most of the progress since then has just been focused on making planes slightly bigger, slightly faster, and with a worldwide movement toward carbon neutrality, more efficient. Now, efficiency is particularly important because the airline industry works on a very tight margin due to the high fixed costs associated with buying aircraft that cost multiple hundred million dollars each, maintenance costs, personnel, and other fixed costs like jet fuel that are mostly unavoidable. So the best way for airlines to cut on operational cost is to save on fuel, which means making planes more efficient. That's why airliners will spend millions on small tweaks to an aircraft that'll only gain them an increase of efficiency of just a couple of percentage points. But Boeing's new wing design promises to do much more than that. So how do we make planes more efficient? When you think about it, it boils down to three things. Making them lighter so it doesn't take the engines as much energy to move the plane from point A to point B. Two, improving engine efficiency to make the most of the fuel in the tanks. And three, reducing drag or aerodynamic losses associated with a solid body moving through a fluid like air. The TTBW wing is a new aircraft design concept that is being developed by NASA in collaboration with Boeing. It's a high aspect ratio swept wing design that features a pair of aerodynamic struts and extends outward from the fuselage to support the wing. This truss structure helps to make the wings thinner, reducing its weight and improve its efficiency, allowing for greater fuel savings and increased range. Boeing expects between 9 and 10% increases in fuel efficiency from the new wing design alone, but coupled with lighter construction materials and a new more efficient engine, which I'll talk about more in a minute, they hope to get a net increase of around 30% over the 777X or 737 MAX, which is already the most efficient jetliner in the world, at least 12% more efficient than its closest competitor, the Airbus A350-1000. This is huge in many ways. A step increase in efficiency of 10% may not seem like much, but remember that airliners will spend millions of dollars on just a couple of extra percent in efficiency since the offset of fuel costs will pay for it. For example, a Boeing 777-TAC-9 holds around 52,000 gallons of jet fuel, but if it was less efficient like the A350, it would need around 58,000 gallons for the same range. In the case of a jetliner of similar size with a new transonic wing design making it 10% more efficient, it would only require 47,000 gallons of fuel. So compared to an A350, airlines would save around 11,000 gallons of gallons of gallons of gallons. Oh, I gotta restart, Ricky, sorry. Yeah, it's crashed. So compared to a A350, airlines would save around 11,000 gallons of fuel per flight. At $3.28 per gallon, that adds up to a savings around $36,000 per flight. The longest possible flight today lasts around 22 hours, and the average turnaround time for long haul flights is around 90 to 120 minutes. So a single airliner could, in theory, fly 365 long haul flights per year. But let's consider just 300 to account for the occasional downtime and extra maintenance and repairs. That means that the extra fuel efficiency provided by the TTBW wing will save an airline almost $11 million every year on fuel alone. Triple that if you add the next generation CFM Rise engine. More on that again in just a little bit. This new design also brings some key benefits for everyday people like you and me. But before I get to that, I think you're gonna love our sponsor this week, Renogy. This is the Renogy Portable Power Station 1000. And while small and portable, this thing really packs a punch. With one kilowatt hour of storage on board, it can power a ton of stuff. If you like camping, outdoor adventures, or van life, this thing can power all sorts of things like lights, computers, mini fridges, 
even a portable induction cooktop like this one. With 1500 watts of AC output and USB A and C ports, you can power almost anything or leave it plugged in and charged and it's great for emergency backup power. Plug in your fridge and it'll stay cold for hours or plug in your internet modem and wireless router and browse web on your laptops and phones even when the power is out. The build quality is fantastic and the excellent EV grade thermal management system and batteries means you get long lasting portable power and top notch safety. The included smartphone app makes it easy to monitor and keep tabs on power usage, charge remaining and solar input. Yeah, add some Renogy solar panels and you can even charge this thing day after day entirely off grid. Check out the Renogy Power Station 1000 today using the links in the description. Huge thanks to Renogy and you for supporting the show. For starters, since it reduces operational cost, it has the potential to lead to lower airline tickets on long haul flights. Not bad. I know I would have benefited from that on my recent trip to India just a couple of weeks ago. Also, a 10% increase in fuel efficiency means a 10% decrease in carbon emissions. So these jets will be greener than any before. Reducing fuel consumption by 11,000 gallons would cut down carbon emissions by 106 metric tons per flight or almost 32,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide per year per jetliner. With 25,500 jetliners in service worldwide, switching all airliners to a 10% more efficient design could reduce carbon emissions by over 800 million tons of CO2 per year. That's the equivalent of removing approximately 176 million combustion cars from the road. This wing design is also expected to be quieter than conventional configurations, both during takeoff, landing, and in flight. I think that another equally important benefit of this design is that it's an exceptional increase in efficiency from aerodynamics alone. This means that this wing design by itself could be implemented on any type of aircraft, including electric airplanes, further improving the range or payload capacity. While we may not see any electric versions of the VS-1 and VS-2 prototypes, we may see smaller aircraft for short haul flights to neighboring cities. Let's go a bit deeper and talk about this new wing design. The key to the transonic truss braced wing design is its aspect ratio, which is twice as high as previous Boeing airliners. This is the ratio between the wingspan or the distance from wingtip to wingtip and the wings average cord or the mean distance from the leading edge or front side of the wing that faces the incoming air to the trailing edge or backside of the wing. So the aspect ratio gives us an idea of how long versus is how wide the wing is. The transonic truss braced wing is a very high aspect ratio wing, meaning that it's very long wingspan and is very thin. So the, what's the point of making wings longer and thinner? Well, there are four key benefits. High aspect ratio wings have a lower drag coefficient compared to wings with a lower aspect ratio, but you can make them with the same overall surface area to generate the same amount of lift. This means that they can generate lift more efficiently. High aspect ratio wings can also be lighter than low aspect ratio wings, which can contribute to reduced fuel consumption and increased payload capacity. And they can also generate smaller wingtip vortices, which cause drag, further improving efficiency. So these wings are pretty awesome, but they're not especially new. We've known about this concept for decades. I mean, gliders use high aspect ratio wings to fly effortlessly without an engine, and those date back to the 1920s. So the natural question is, why haven't we been building all our aircraft with these types of wings to begin with? As always in engineering, the answer is there's a trade-off. Here are the cons of a high aspect ratio wing. The main drawback of thin wings is that they're not as strong as shorter, sturdier wings. So you need a truss structure with these struts to hold the wings in place, ergo the name truss braced wing. Their wings are also too thin to effectively be used as fuel tanks. You need to put the tank somewhere else. They have a lower roll rate and are generally less maneuverable than wings with a lower aspect ratio. This can be a disadvantage for certain aircraft types such as fighter jets, but not so much of a big deal for commercial airliners. High aspect ratio wings are also more susceptible to turbulence and fluttering, which can cause aerodynamic problems and make the flight less comfortable for the passengers. That's something that we're gonna have to really keep an eye on. Another big issue with longer wingspans, like on the Boeing 787 Dreamliner, is that they're not allowed in the smaller, cheaper airport gates. The maximum legal span of a gate size for a Boeing 737 or an Airbus A320 is 118 feet. The Boeing 777 is already too long and needs foldable wingtips. And so traditional gates can accommodate all types of aircraft, really massive wing aircraft like the 787 
or the A380, the massive double-decker Airbus aircraft, require gates with special considerations, larger areas for those massive wings, which limits the number of airports that these planes are allowed in. The VS-1 and VS-2 with the new TTBW wings will be even longer, so they'll probably have foldable wing mechanisms to retract the wings upward like an aircraft on a Navy fighter carrier deck to be able to operate once landed on the ground. These trade-offs mostly resulted in earlier truss-braced designs being more efficient but much slower than other competing jets, and airlines just wanted to fly faster. They didn't care as much about efficiency back then when fuel was much cheaper. Today's new materials and better design allow for flight speeds of up to Mach 0.8, which is pretty much the same as a 747. At those speeds, the air that accelerates over the wings actually breaks the sound barrier and goes supersonic and slows down again near the trailing edge of the wing. This is why we call this transonic flight, because some parts of the wing are actually experiencing supersonic air while others aren't. This creates a special type of drag from the supersonic shockwave that reduces efficiency. To allow higher overall speed, the wings are swept back, reducing the onset of supersonic air on top of the wing. Why are we talking about this now? Well, the reason why this made headlines recently is that the development of the Boeing prototype will be funded in part by NASA. In other words, by the taxes we all pay. NASA granted Boeing the contract for the full-scale crewed commercial aircraft technology pathfinder for NASA's Sustainable Flight National Partnership last January 18th, investing $425 million over seven years, with Boeing pitching in another $725 million. This is such an important project for Boeing that the company won't even bother working on a new commercial jet design this year. Instead, focusing all of its energy on making the game-changing cross between the McDonnell Douglas MD-90 and their supersonic ultra-green aircraft research prototype, the Sugarvolt. At the end of the project, they should have two full-scale VS-1 and VS-2 prototypes ready for their maiden flight in 2028, and a commercial version by as soon as 2035 to 2040. So yes, not exactly tomorrow, but pretty exciting stuff. If this plays out well, you'll probably see other aircraft manufacturers following suit and building their own version of transonic jets with truss braced wings. And when it comes to engine selection, there seems to be only one logical choice, the new CFM Rise engine. Boeing and Airbus recently fitted their 737 and A320 family of jetliners with new CFM Leap engines, 15% more efficient than their predecessors, but now there's a new, even more efficient engine on the horizon. I'm talking about the CFM's revolutionary innovation for sustainable engines or CFM rise. Gotta love the marketing. Good stuff. <laughs> this is an unducted open fan or prop fan engine. It's 20% more efficient than the CFM leap, mainly due to a higher bypass ratio of about 20%. This means that the fans push 20 times more cold air to the back than the air that it sucks through the core. I think there are several reasons to believe that both the VS-1 and 2 will be equipped with the CFM Rise engine. These engines are designed for a cruising speed of approximately Mach 0.8, which is the same cruising speed intended for the TTBW wings. These types of open fan engines usually have longer propeller blades, so they need to be installed high above the ground, making the new VS-1 and 2 with their high wing design the ideal use case. NASA and Boeing target an overall increase in efficiency of 30% for the VS-1 and 2, which fits perfectly with the 10% increase from the wing design, plus another 20% boost from the new Rise engine. So what's funny, in an ironic twist of fate, is that in the end, the most modern of Boeing's airliners will look like a revisited version of a really old and slow turboprop aircraft. And it's like taking a step backwards in time, but obviously you know there's more to it than just that. So after looking at some of the details behind these new jetliners, I thought it would be interesting to look at Boeing's most recent designs side by side and compare some specs. So as you can see, the VS-2's wingspan is about 50% longer than the 737 MAX, which is the closest, most efficient equivalent. The estimated fuel efficiencies are also added for reference. Notice how the 737 MAX is way more efficient than a 777-TAC-9. But I also wanted to put that efficiency into context. So let's compare it to other means of transportation like cars, buses, and trains. The following table shows the average passenger miles per gasoline gallon equivalent, so we can compare all these transportation methods together. Together. This is just a way to convert all the different types of fuels out there into a single common unit, which is the gasoline gallon equivalent. A couple of things stand out to me here. First, the fact that we make better use of energy by ride sharing or carpooling on an ice car than by traveling on a bus. I always thought city buses were way more efficient, but it turns out it's not always the case. Second, Boeing's VS-2 with its transonic truss braced wing flying completely full would have an efficiency comparable 
to an averagely full transit train. So it's not quite as efficient as I would have hoped, and it doesn't really compare to a fully loaded electrical train, but it's still way better than other aircraft of the day, not to mention the speed benefits and point-to-point -point airport routing. You know how Elon Musk and SpaceX are always talking about using Starship for intercontinental Earth-to-Earth -Earth travel? Let's see how that would compare. Starship holds approximately 250 metric tons of liquid methane, which are equivalent to around 105,000 gallons of gasoline. According to SpaceX, it could carry around 1,000 people per trip. The longest possible Earth-to-Earth -Earth distance is the arc along the equator that goes from one point to the opposite side of the Earth. That's a travel distance of around 12,400 miles in a single flight. So Starship's efficiency in an ideal case of maximum number of passengers and a maximum travel distance would be around 118 passenger miles per gallon equivalent. So pretty much in the ballpark of conventional aircraft, but a lot worse than Boeing's new designs, especially if they reach that 30% increase thanks to that CFM rise engine. Still not bad considering that a Starship is going into orbit and coming back again. And not to mention the increase in speed, which I think would far outpace any aircraft. Now the only thing missing to satisfy my curiosity is to see how the VS2 stacks up against a Tesla Model Y, because why not? So this is super satisfying. If a full Tesla can do almost as well in terms of total efficiency as a mass transit system like a train, it means that we can make a big difference by carpooling in a Tesla. Furthermore, if a jetliner like the VS2 prototype can get so much more efficient by just optimizing its wing design, imagine what we could accomplish if we went electric. The development of transonic truss braced wings is a promising step forward, making air travel more sustainable and environmentally friendly, which is one of the toughest modes of transportation to crack. While aviation may never be as efficient and carbon neutral as other forms of transportation, the improvements made by Boeing and NASA are significant and should be celebrated. As we continue to search for ways to reduce our carbon footprint and protect the planet, breakthroughs like the TTBW design give us hope that we could finally find solutions to the problems that we face. I've seen several people complain about why is NASA using public funds to help Boeing, a private company, develop this prototype. But the fact is that Boeing would never have single-handedly invested what they needed to to develop this new technology because it's too risky. Using your money and mine, NASA is helping push aeronautics forward. And this will benefit us all at least anybody who travels via air. It'll mean improvements to Boeing's bottom line, of course, but that's what companies do. This is in large part why companies in aviation industry don't take more risks. That's why planes look the same. The design approval process, flight testing, that entire process of design to a new aircraft can take decades, sometimes two. And that's why you can't really take too many risks because this is people's lives at 38,000 feet that we're talking about. And this is a pretty big deal. I think it's so ironic that one of these new TTBW wings looks like design from the past, back when we didn't have structures and composite alloys and aluminum strong enough to hold those big wings, but now we do, it's just they're getting thinner and thinner. It's really a cool story, and I can't wait to see the first aircraft with this technology taken off at an airport near you. All right, thanks so much for watching. If you like this video, check out this one next. I think you're going to like. And until next time, I'm Ricky. This is Tuba Da Vinci. Thank you so much for watching.